Uf, 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 uf. Or good afternoon, rather. How are you guys doing? I hope you're having an excellent Friday. It's sunny. I'm happy to. <sighs> Hello, Pika Pika. We Matt Lavin today. We're gonna do. We're gonna do a demo. Um, I don't know exactly how this is gonna go, but we have a motor that we're gonna look at. We're gonna do this together. It's gonna be a collaborative. Hey, hey, thank goodness it's Friday. Good afternoon, Benny. We're gonna play with this today. We're gonna play with this today. We're gonna try some stuff. We're gonna do some things. Hello, Kate. Thank goodness it's Friday. Oh, man. Oh, yes. Anybody watch Pokemon Direct? I don't know what that is. Nuka says, unfortunately? What happened? Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl have been confirmed for late 2021. Nikta says, Hi all, happy Friday. I added the timestamps for lectures and I'll try to do that the same day of each lecture. Nikta, thank you so much. You are amazing. That makes the video so much easier uh, to follow. So, very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I might get back into Pokemon. My brother got, I think, Pokemon Sword, and he he said it wasn't worth the purchase. Yeah, I mean, Pokemon Yellow, Pokemon Gold and Silver, that was my childhood. Dr. E, you kind of look like the guy on Firefly Lane. What is that? Firefly Lane? John Michael Ecker. <laughs> All right, hold on. Uh huh? Maybe? Some similarity? The goatee? The goatee? That's kind of going on right now. Didn't know I was an actor as well. Well, that's what it is. <sighs> Guys, um, let's get started here. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what I want to do here.
Okay, so what we've been looking at. Wait, why are we looking at pics of Dr. E on Google? <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, okay, okay. So we've been looking at, depending on where your discrete time roots are, you get different behavior. And we've been classifying this behavior in terms of some general things, settling time, overshoot, rise time, um, well these are, the, these are the big ones, these are the big ones. And so we're getting an idea of how the root position affects these things. So what I want to do today, I want to find out the discrete time roots of a DC motor. So I have a DC motor here. I'm going to show it to you in a second. We have a wheel hooked up to it. And we're going to try to figure out what the discrete time roots are doing a little system identification experiment. Um, this motor and the configuration I have it in is a little different than I've used because I've, I've used a motor like this in previous semesters, but it changed a little bit. So I want to run a new system identification experiment. I don't have this model in advance. So we're going to derive this model together in real time and I'll show you some system identification techniques. Um, and so we're going to get a model and then Hopefully we're successful with that and it doesn't take too much time because I want to do one more thing. I want to um, add a proportional controller. And this is, I think, the simplest type of contr a feedback controller you can add. And I want to see how this changes the location of the discrete roots for this system. And maybe we can try different controllers to try to dial in these discrete time roots where we want them to be. Because that's what a controller does. It takes the original discrete time roots, which they are what they are for a given system, and we modify them to what we want them to be. So let's get started. Is this related to part six of the homework? Um, not directly. This system is actually a little simpler, I think, but you could use some of these principles. Okay, this is our motor, and uh, you might recognize where this uh, wheel came from. But I plead, I plead the fifth. Um, okay, let us murder. It's not murder, it's um, temporary dismemberment. Wally's okay. It's just just missing a missing a foot, missing a foot right now. That's okay. It's for it's for education. Okay, and so you can kind of see in the background here, I have an Arduino, I have a DC motor driver, and out of frame I have a six volt power supply. I know, I know, it's, it's brutal. But, but this, is for, this is for science, this is for education. So we have a six volt, we have a six volt power supply attached to a brushless. I mean a brushed DC motor. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run an experiment and gather some data. And I'm gonna show you the type of experiment 
that I ran, there's a couple things you can do. So we're gonna have to open up some Arduino code. All right, where are you? So I'm gonna open this. And I don't want you to get bogged down in this code too much. I'm just gonna point out some major things. Uh, the first major thing is, actually we, we call this the sample period. And so I'm gonna have the time in between samples to be 0 0.05 seconds. So that means I'm gathering 20 samples per second and uh, easy, buy an $800 oscilloscope. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and we are, we're also gonna be sending commands to the motor at 20 samples per second. Uh, so let's go into, don't worry about all these things. Let's go into the code a little bit. Okay, so if you've never worked with Arduino coding before, there's basically two main parts. There's a setup, and here's where you like initialize some variables and stuff, don't worry about it. And then there's a loop, and this loop just runs over and over and over again. Now notice the first thing that I do in the loop. I put an if statement, and what this if statement means is we're only gonna do the stuff in this loop if a certain amount of time has passed. So this is just checking how much time has passed since we last ran this loop. So I'm only letting this loop run 20 times a second, and I'm strictly enforcing that. So that's how we regulate that sampling rate. I know what it is. So let me tell you what I'm doing inside the loop. There's different types of tests you can do to perform system identification on a system. I know I said system twice in that same sentence. Um, but one popular one, actually let's do this other one first. I'm gonna provide a sinusoidal input, but the frequency of this sinusoid is gonna change over time. So, and when I say sinusoidal input, the input to this DC motor is a voltage. So we're gonna provide a sinusoidal voltage signal and, and you'll see what happens. Um, so I need to comment out this part because this is providing a square wave, but this is what we'll do later. This part of my code is checking if the sampling period that I wanted is what's actually happening. So I want this to be equal to 0 0.05 seconds, but we will see when I run this code, it might actually be a little bit different. And that's just life. This variable, which I called U2, it reads the angular position of the motor from an encoder that's attached to the bottom of the motor, which is, it's out of frame, but like on the bottom of this motor, there's, there's a rotary encoder sensor. So I read the angular position. And then I do a very crude estimate of the angular velocity. I take the current angular position reading, I subtract the previous, and I divide it by how much time has passed between when I got those samples. So this is a very crude way of estimating the angular velocity, but it's, it's fine for our purposes for right now. So I'm reading angular velocity of this motor 20 times a second. Um, and then I'm going to print all this data out to a serial monitor so we can see it. A little late to the party, but what does micros give? Micros returns how many microseconds this program has been running since I started it. So that's a way of keeping track of time. It like accesses the computer's clock. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, this is how I provide voltage to the motor. Um, I specify a pulse width modulation duty cycle from the Arduino. It sends that command to the motor controller and then the motor controller decides how much voltage to send to the, to the actual motor. Don't get bogged down too much here. All, all the, you, you'll see what I want you to get out of this. So let's, let's upload this code. 
let's run it and then I'll tell you because we're, we're gonna be able to visualize some data coming off of this so I'm gonna plug everything in you're gonna see the motor start spinning up in a second here uh, let's hopefully Wait, 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 wait. Which one do I have here? I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this. Oh, because I need to change this. Let's make it, let's make it that. Let's make it that. I'm going to go to the serial plotter. Now this green line is that angular velocity calculation. So that's the velocity of the motor. You see it's going positive, negative. The red line is the voltage that I'm sending to the motor. And it's in a sinusoidal pattern. And this test, you can see the frequency is increasing over time. So I'm testing how this responds to a bunch of different frequencies. And we'll just keep going for a little bit. We'll let Wally's leg do some work, do some workout gain some muscle oh wait shoot we're gonna have to run that again um, is it natural for it to be out of phase like that yes okay so this is the same data but I'm printing out the purple line was the time so this first column is how much time has passed in seconds so this has been running for 18 seconds now the middle column is the voltage going to the motor. So it's positive, negative. The third column is the angular velocity of the motor using that really crummy difference approximation. So we're just letting this collect, 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 collect. And then I'll, I'll stop auto scrolling I'll turn this off and this is the very crude way in which I collect data I actually copy and paste from this serial monitor let's go let's go here wait I want to go here and then I'm gonna copy I'm gonna copy this I'm gonna paste it to um, a text file and then I'm gonna save this text file and I'm gonna open it in MATLAB where I can run a system identification experiment. So let's do sign sweep uh, version 2, 226. So I'm saving this. I'm gonna go into MATLAB and I have a code open. Uh, sign sweep, I think I called it version two. This code that you're looking at and it, I mentioned this detail for graduate students out there. This code uses the Eigen system realization algorithm. And it's a way of getting a discrete time model from a set of data. So if you're interested in system ID, your graduate project could be on this algorithm. Uh, so let me, we'll load this, let me run this, and then I'll explain a little bit of what it's giving. Oh no, what did I do? Oh, I think I have to change this. There's this P variable which changes the behavior of how this system ID algorithm works. Okay, so what I did is I loaded in the original data. This top graph is the voltage. So this is just the data from the text file, right? I just loaded this in. So this is as a function of time, we ran for like 45 seconds. So I have voltage, and then down here is the corresponding angular velocity over time. So I load in the input data, so the inputs are on the top. You think BB-8 is scared? You mean this guy, th that guy right over there on the shelf? I would love to build a BB-8. Okay, so this second one is the output data, the angular velocity. And then, in short, what this system identification algorithm does is it tries to fit that data with a model. So this green line 
is the model that this algorithm came up with. And there's, there's nothing fancy to this so much. It's kind of like doing a regression, but it's finding the differential equation, or rather the difference equation that minimizes errors. The problem with this algorithm is, um, what order, I think, this, mo this parameter dictates sort of what order model. How come the envelope closes in or uh, closes? Oh, oh, how come the envelope decreases? So yeah, the angular velocity got slower and slower. You can see like it's decaying a little bit, even though the voltage is the same. So this is natural. Every system responds differently depending on the frequency at which you apply an input to it. And this is a clue that this is behaving like a first order system, which I want a first order model for this because if you go back in your memory banks and think about Bode plots for a first order system, the amplitude of the magnitude portion of the Bode plot it drops off over time. Meaning, if you give a sinusoidal input of higher and higher frequency, the output amplitude is gonna get smaller and smaller, and that's what you're seeing. The frequency increased and the amplitude got smaller. And this is dropping off with approximately 20 decibels per decade of increasing frequency. It's true. Um, okay. So let me talk about this plot. So this generated an eighth order model. So, cause I had P equal to eight, but this graph is a graph of, I know you can't even read this cause it's so small, but it says mode singular values. This is a way of saying which mode of the model is most important. So even though this is an eighth order model, this graph is telling you that some portions of this model are more important than others. And it's saying these two particular modes are the most important. So this is where model reduction comes in. I started with an eighth order model, but this is saying, hey, if you just keep these two, these are way more important than say keeping this eighth mode. Um, so what I did in this code, I think I, programmed it in so it only keeps the modes that are above a significance of 0.9. Um, but then after I threw out the other modes, you see that it doesn't actually match as well. So this requires some art where you decide which modes you want to keep, which ones you don't want to keep. And tweaking around with this P parameter at the very beginning it gives you different models. Um, so let's see this one. Okay, after throwing some modes out, it's it also didn't give me a very good match. But the original, like if you keep all 12 components, it does do a very good match. Um, okay. So like I said, I wanna get a first order model. So, This wasn't working very well for me earlier, like eliminating modes and getting down to one order, like the singular value, whatever, they just weren't lining up the way I wanted. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a different kind of test. And we're gonna do a cruder form of system identification, okay? And we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the step response of this motor. Let's go back to this Arduino code. Um, different code, I want, no, different one. I want this. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna comment out this sinusoidal input stuff because we're done with that. We're not gonna do that test again. We're gonna do a square wave test. A square wave creates a step response in one direction followed by a step response in the other direction. So we're gonna, you'll see, you'll see. 
I think I want to do this. I think I want to do this. I think I want to do this. And I think, I think I want to comment these out for now. Okay. And then I'm going to change the duty cycle. Okay. I think that'll be fine. Let's upload this. Let's run the test. Let's see what it looks like. First, we'll look at the serial plotter. Let's upload this. Okay, so you see that the red is the voltage. I'm going like plus some voltage, then minus some voltage, and that causes it to spin up in either direction. The blue line is just the time, which is accumulating, so that, don't really pay attention to that. And what I want to do with this data is I want to estimate the time constant or, or the settling time as well because that describes the properties of a first order model. Okay, so let's close out of this and let's collect some data with the serial monitor. And we're gonna import this data into MATLAB. So minus 4.2 volts, plus 4.2, minus 4.2, plus 4.2. That's our input. Okay, that's probably probably enough let's turn this off actually first I'm gonna I'm gonna see what the system ID algorithm does with this let's go here and I don't know if this is gonna give me the first order model that I want I'd have to play around with it a little bit um, let's start here I think All right, I'm gonna copy this we're gonna make a new text file. We're gonna save it and then we're gonna import it in MATLAB. So this is gonna be square wave version two. We're going over to MATLAB. All right, square wave. So we're loading in this text file that I just saved. We're gonna run this. I'm gonna set this P value I'm gonna try two at first and just see what this does. I'm curious. This might give us a decent model. Are right, we running it? Okay. It's not matching. Okay, this was our original. It made a second order model that basically fit this data fairly well. And then what happened? So this time it only has two modes. So it has this one, which is more important, and this one. And I think I programmed it to neglect this mode. And when it neglects it, it actually lost some fidelity of the model. So this is a first order model that is not matching as well as it should. So what I want to do we're just going to do, we're going to do this together. We're going to do, we're going to derive a first order model in a more crude way. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a peek at the original data. So this is our voltage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to like zoom in here and I'm going to zoom in on this. Let's look at this one and this, is like a first order step response. Wait, why are these points on top of each other? It's supposed to be getting samples every 0.2 seconds. Weird, okay. Not totally sure why. Because there was that if statement in the code, which makes sure that we only grab one data point every 0.2 seconds. I don't know, a little weird. Okay, but what I wanna do, let's look at this 
and estimate the settling time. Let's just do this very crude first. So the settling time is the amount of time it takes to get within 2% of the final value. And this data, it's a little noisy. It is hard to tell. But I mean, we could guess it's like 0.2 seconds. What do you, what do you guys say? Maybe because it starts at two seconds, it goes up. We could say maybe it's 0.3 seconds to get within 2%. What do you think? We'll try point three. Point two five. Point three. Okay. Let's say. Okay. By crude visual inspection, we're going to say the settling time from this experiment is around 0 0.3 seconds. All right. Now, how is this related to a discrete time system? Um, we know that the settling time for a second order system is approximately equal to four over the damping ratio times the natural frequency. Well, there's a similar, a similar formula for first order systems. Because um, really, if you think about the root where this came from, we'll call it lambda c, the root was minus zeta omega n plus or minus omega d times i. So this zeta omega n is the negative of the real part of the underlying root. So really there's a more general formula for minus the real part of the root. And this formula works for first order systems as well as second order. So I want to get a first order model for this motor. So I'm going to say that 0 0.3 is approximately equal to minus 4 over the real part of whatever the continuous time root is. So from here, we can say that the real part of the continuous root, where for a first order root, there's only a real part anyways. Um, this is going to be minus 4 over 0 0.3. So we'll say lambda C is, we're going to go to MATLAB and, can you please turn the background music? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem with that. Minus 4 divided by 0 0.3. So that's minus 13.33. Now if we want the discrete time root, we're going to have E to the continuous root times our sampling period. So we're going to have E to the minus 13.33 times 0 0.05 seconds. Okay, so I'm going to calculate that in MATLAB. 0 0.05. 0 0.5134. So if we were to draw this in the complex plane, which is what we've been playing with for the last couple classes, you know, we have like the unit circle for stability, and this has radius one, and the root for this DC motor 
to somewhere like, boom, right there on that real axis. So now that we have this root, we can get the characteristic equation for the motor. We can also get a difference equation. So let's do that. It's just going to be lambda d minus 0 0.5134 equals 0. Because the solution of this equation would be that root. So this must be the characteristic equation. And from here, we can get our difference equation, which would be xk is 0 0.5134 times x k minus 1. This right here is the homogeneous form. So this doesn't have any input to it. Um, however, what we're doing is we're applying a, a voltage to this motor. So we're having some input. Excuse me. For higher order systems, if you just want to write down the difference equation for, for applying some input, it's a little tricky. It's, it's not always straightforward, even, even though we'll, we'll cover techniques in this class later on to, to really give us that. Um, but it turns out for a first order system, so it's going to be pretty easy to add a, a, a term that accounts for that input. So this is going to modify our difference equation. We're going to take this and we're going to take some amplitude times an input u. Now we know, so uh, let, let's keep this connected to, to a physical thing for a little bit. What does x represent? This is our angular velocity of the motor. And just to be explicit here, I, I'm measuring it in radians per second. Now the input that we're providing, let's just call it a voltage. So in volts. And what I want to do, I want to figure out what this A parameter is, what that scaling factor might be. Let's open up MATLAB again, because I want to get the the amplitude of the voltage we were providing. So this is the step response we were analyzing. And this is the amplitude of voltage that we were giving. 4.2. So I'll go back here. So for this system, we could say that you at whatever step k, it's just going to be 4.2. Like for this whole duration that we're analyzing, we turned on that voltage, it was 4.2, and it caused this response. Okay. So I know what number is going to be going in, in there all the time. So now I want to show you one way to get this, an estimate of this parameter a. So as, oh, that's, it, that's at, as k grows bigger, as it approaches infinity, even though we get, we get nowhere near infinity, um, you'll notice that the angular velocity also approached a steady state value. 
So the limit as k approaches infinity of x k, it goes to some constant, which we'll call x steady steady state. Let's go back to MATLAB and figure out what that constant is. So it goes up and then the angular velocity kind of settles here. And if we were very precise, we'd want to calculate the mean of this, but I'm just gonna eyeball it. And it looks like it's 15.5. That's somewhere like in the middle. And so let's just say that's what it is. Oops, I went the wrong way. 15.5 radians per second. Okay. Now, here's another thing at steady state, and you can use this on the homework. I think this is one of the hints that I give you. But as k approaches infinity, you know, the limit x is approaching the steady state value. So you could say that xk is approximately xk minus 1. They're basically the same. We've, we've reached steady, steady state, so it's not changing with k anymore. So what I can do, I can go back to this equation and I'll say if I take the limit as k approaches infinity, uh, this equation is going to be x steady state, because I'm assuming we're at steady state, is going to be 0 0.5134 times x steady state plus a times u. And we know u is always 4.2. So here I can solve for a. Okay, a is going to be 1 minus 0 0.5134 times x steady state divided by 4.2. And x steady state we said was like 15.5. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to punch these numbers into MATLAB right now. Okay. 1 minus 0 0.5134 times 15.5 divided by 4.2. And I got 1.796. All right, and th so this gives us our final estimate of our difference equation for this DC motor. I'm thinking, so what you would usually do next is you test how well this model replicates the data that you collected. And actually, I think we can do that. Um, let's go back here. So let's see how we did, because I think at the bottom of this code, I have a way of doing this. I want to do... This is what I'm plotting. Okay, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do, yeah, this is what I was doing before, something like this. So this is where we're gonna plug in our difference equation. So we're gonna have 0 0.5134 I know the, the variable name and the indices, like I'm using k plus one instead, but this is the same difference equation. 796 times, I think I do this. Um, okay, 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 okay. 
Okay. Now I have to just plot this. I have to plot this. Why is it UK minus one and not UK? That has to do with causality. And, and I can elaborate a little more on that. But for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to see. I want to focus on this. Okay, so this is going to plot our original data and then our estimated data in green. Hopefully, 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 hopefully. Uh, so I think I have to do this. Oh. So this green is the model that we just came up with. And you know, it's funny, because like, you know how we did a bunch of different steps? We used this set of data exclusively to come up with our model. And look, it's like, boom, it is perfect for that. And notice it, on the other side, it doesn't match quite as well. And this is a good example of, you know how I told you that quote before that all mathematical models are wrong, but some are useful. Like this motor, I think it's asymmetrical in a way where if I provide the same voltage, but in the different direction, it just happens that in the other direction, it spins a little faster. Um, okay. But this is nice, this is nice. So like, I'm pretty satisfied that this first order model at this sampling rate, decently, not perfectly, but kind of decently captures the behavior. Once you have a model, this is where we can start modifying things to do control. Let me show you really quick. We have like a couple minutes, so I think we can, we can make this work. Okay, consider this. Consider if we define UK minus one is some like gain K, so this is like a scripty K that I'm drawing. And we make it equal to a reference signal. Let's call it like RK minus one. The difference between this reference signal and X. So now we're starting to talk like control if I have a reference like a desired angular velocity, and then if x is just our measured angular velocity, let's see what substituting this in up here does to our equation. So substitute uk minus 1. We're going to have xk is 0 0.5134 xk minus 1 plus 1.796 times k, which we haven't decided what that is yet, rk minus 1 minus xk minus 1. Now I'm going to gather these terms. So this is going to be 0 0.5134 minus 1.796 k times xk minus 1 plus 1. Wait a second. I think I wanted to define that input slightly differently. K. No, I guess that's fine. Uh, 
Oh, uh, no, what I wanted to do... No, we'll just leave it like this for now. Even though it's a little non-standard. I just realized what you usually do... Is you, you have the gain multiplying just the measurement, not the reference itself. So really, I shouldn't have had this K being distributed. I guess it's not too late. Let's change it. So this is going to be... No, no, wait. No, I, I take it back. I take it back. I think the original was right. Sorry for flip, flip flopping on you guys. Let's just leave it. Okay, one point seven. Okay. Okay. So here's the main thing that I want to tell you. This is what we call our closed loop difference equation. This is our new difference equation after we have our input, which we use this one, uh, which, which uses feedback. It depends on measured values of that dependent variable. So this is our closed loop. So if you get the, this has a new characteristic equation. All right. And the new characteristic equation is lambda D, maybe I'll call it lambda D closed loop. minus equals zero. So we have a new closed loop eigenvalue, which is just this times K. And so as the control design engineers, we choose this and depending on what we choose, this is going to change um, that eigenvalue or that root of the characteristic equation and that's going to change the settling time of this system. So we're a little bit out of time, but maybe that's the first thing that we'll do on Monday. We'll come back and I'll adjust our code so that we provide an input that changes the characteristic equation to be like this. And we'll try to choose a value of k that dials in the settling time to what we want it to be. So right now the settling time was like 0.3 seconds. Let's try to change it to 0.5. Let's try to change it to one second. And um, it'll only affect the settling time. Well, it'll, for a first order system, you don't have overshoot. Um, I don't even think you technically have a rise time because it never crosses the steady state value. It only gets exponentially closer. So we'll change the settling time. The other thing that it's going to change is what we call the steady state error, which we'll also define that in the next class. That's how close you get to the desired value. So 
our new equation has this reference. It's the desired angular velocity. Let's say I want to get up to one radian per second. I'll tell you in advance, this controller, this, propor this proportional controller will not perfectly bring us to that. We'll have some error. So we're going to have to design new types of controllers that change the settling time and eliminate steady state error. And I think that's all coming in the next week. So it's, it's here. It's upon us. We're starting to do controls. Is this con similar to continuous systems with the fact that this is first order subject to step input? It will always have error steady state. Um, it's the steady state error for a control system comes down to the system type and type is a technical name here for continuous systems it's how many closed loop or how many open loop poles you have at zero determines your system type so in continuous systems if you have one open loop pole which means if your characteristic equation before you apply any control system so if your open loop system before we do controls if that has a root at zero then you'll have no steady state error. Difference equations and digital controls has a similar rule. Uh, you need an open loop root at one, not at the origin. So we'll cover that and we'll talk about why you need an open loop root at one. Okay, but that's that's it for today, everybody. Um, we did a lot of different things. We got a, we got a model for this little guy. You should be very proud of yourselves. And then we'll we'll put it to use next time we meet. Really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, if you're if you're a graduate student and you're interested in system identification, this kind of thing, like running tests to get a model, um, you can contact me about that. I have resources to share. Um, I, I really love system ID. When we did the step response, it reminded me of the 454 plots. Yes, you could do the same thing with a vehicle like if you torque the steering wheel if you have sensors on your car you can backtrack because um, like we had we had stability derivatives in road vehicle dynamics you could backtrack what those are for your vehicle um, Pika says can something like this be our project yes but um, it would have to be more involved than the crude system identification that we did. You'd have to do like, um, you'd have to develop something like that other code that I had that wasn't doing what I wanted. The Eigen system realization algorithm. There's other, there's other system identification approaches. System ID is really sweet. Kate says, I'd love to do more with system ID. I love system ID, it's, it's fascinating. Have a great weekend, D-Stratus. Have a great weekend, Mike. Um, have a great weekend, Benny. Will we talk about adaptive controls in this class? I don't know if we will get into adaptive control. I plan on getting into LQR, but I don't know if we'll have time to do adaptive. Anyway, system ID could be gamified. That's a really interesting question. Like, okay, this is just an idea I have. System ID, in my opinion, it's about 
it's a trade-off between getting an accurate model and having that model be as simple as possible. Like for this motor, the, the system ID algorithm that I was using, it could give me a really nice eighth order or 10th order, and I could even make it like a 20th order model. But I feel like that's overkill because a first order model does a good job. So system ID is like, in my mind, it's like, I knew I wanted a first order because it basically gets the job done and how close can I get that? Um, so maybe a game could be something examining that trade-off. Like you want to minimize the order, but you want to still make it accurate enough. Um, I mean, sir, wait, somebody said, no, 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 no. Says, will you be teaching system ID again? Um, I don't know if I will. Now Dr. Singh teaches system ID. And I think for the foreseeable future, he'll be doing that class. If you're interested in system ID, I, I suggest it. I very much enjoyed uh, system ID. Well, I didn't take system ID with Dr. Singh, but I took other courses with him. Very good. Uh, do you teach any other grad courses besides RVD in this one? Um, not right now. Not right now. I don't think, nope. Um, Dr. Singh, he's great, yeah. Reminds me of regression models. Yeah, this is, system ID is, it's a type of regression analysis. But it, it's cool because it's more abstract, you know. It's finding a model that fits, it's finding a dynamic model that fits data. It's not like a polynomial that just is what it is. Um, very cool. Um, making an Iron Man reactor? Oh, that does look like it. You're true. You're right. Little do you know, it's just a wheel that I ripped off of my little Wally robot. Okay, guys. I need to sign off, and then I'm going to be back in about 10 minutes for the next lecture, MAE Lab 1. We're gonna be talking about relays. Hey, have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you on Monday. Happy Friday.